<laughs> Hi all, thank you for coming. Um, it's been our honor as the painting department to be hosting Gina Beavers as a visiting artist. We've had a lot of fun with her since she's been here. Um, so Gina's work has been presented in solo exhibitions at galleries including Michael Benevento in Los Angeles, GNYP Gallery, Berlin, Carl Kostial, London, James Fuentes, New York, Gavin Brown's Enterprise, New York, Kaiman Reed, New York, and Canada Gallery, New York, among others. In March of 2019, MoMA PS1 opened Beaver's first solo museum exhibition, Gina Beaver's The Life I Deserve. In the spring of 2020, she will have a solo exhibition at Marion Boski, where she is currently represented. Gina has participated in numerous group shows, and her work has been reviewed in the New York Times, Art Forum, Freeze, The New Yorker, and Modern Painters, among others. Gina holds a BA in Studio Art and Anthropology from the University of Virginia, an MFA in Painting and Drawing from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and an MS in Education from Brooklyn College. She serves as Adjunct Professor for Grad Studio in the Columbia MFA program in the 2019-2020 school year. Please join me in welcoming Gina Beavers. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, oh yeah, sorry. That's my incredibly exciting name, <laughs> name plate. Um, thank you so much to Natalie who is, she just ran over and got me a bottle of water like five minutes ago. I feel like she's just been incredible. Thank you to Willie and Martha for everything, for having me, and to the wonderful students. Um, I met some of you today and had amazing conversations, and I look forward to uh, meeting with more of you. Um, thank you so much for this honor. Um, I have a lot of slides and different things in this presentation. I'm gonna try to go kind of fast through things. Sometimes I'm just gonna be like boop, 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 and we're gonna go quickly. Um, I wanted to lay out my influences, how I made decisions throughout the years about my practice, um, and then at the end I have some like um, things that I think about more broadly in terms of art and the world. And So, okay, let's start. So, uh, first influences. Um, my, I've never really studied art, uh, let's say, in school until I was in college. But my mom was an artist, an art teacher, and we lived uh, back and forth between Europe and the U.S. And it, in the U.S., we lived outside D.C. in Northern Virginia, and we would go to the D.C. museums, which are fantastic, the Museum of American Art, which has a really spectacular um, outsider art um, wing, um, and also the National Portrait Gallery. There's also the National Gallery of Art there, which is fantastic. Um, so at one of those museums, I saw William H. Johnson, um, and I was really moved early on as a, as a young artist in college, um, or even in high school before I really started to make work by his work. Um, and over the years, I feel like I've come to understand it more and more, um, or my attraction to his work. Um, so this is Little Sis, Little Sis from 1944. This is Athlete from 1940. And William H. Johnson was an incredibly accomplished painter who chose to paint in a more naive style. Um, he was painting uh, what he would consider his community, um, his uh, an African American uh, community in the United States. So there's this aspect of uh, you know, he's painting naively, but he's also clearly aware of abstraction. So there's abstract qualities, there's uh, political realities in his work, um, and then there's a personal aspect too. So these layered elements to his work really, uh, I found them really moving. This is obviously related to Van Gogh, the chair. Um, this one is called Breakdown with Flat Tire from 1940. Um, and one of the sad realities for William H. Johnson was that he couldn't really have a career in the United States, so he went to Europe to uh, make his paintings and to have a career. Um, anyway, so that's kind of where I started. This is an amazing piece from the um, Museum of American Art. 
It's called, it's by James Hampton, The Throne of the Third Heaven of the Nation's Millennium General Assembly uh, from 1950 to 1964. So it's like a piece that they think he worked on for about 14 years in, in a garage in Washington, D.C., uh, self-taught artist, outsider artist, um, really spectacular, but really influential on me. He was a custodian. This is a piece outside that museum. Um, it's by Luis Jimenez um, from, this piece I think is from the 80s. Uh, that's fiberglass. All the sculptures are made out of fiberglass. And like in my mind when I first started learning about like Jeff Koons, I thought Luis Jimenez and Jeff Koons were kind of the same. I kind of preferred, I feel like Luis Jimenez is maybe a better Jeff Koons sometimes, um, but in my mind, they're kind of the same artist. Um, so I was an undergrad, I, w I was gonna be pre-med. I was at University of Virginia. Um, and then I decided I was terrible at pre-med. I like flunked out. Um, <laughs> my mom was like, take an art class. So I started taking art classes. I started taking anthropology. And then meanwhile, I was working at a sandwich shop in town and I worked with this really amazing artist named Jen Sorensen, who was uh, completing a women's studies major in anthropology, women's studies. And she was writing her thesis about how uh, women's comics, uh, underground comics, were like carnival. Um, this idea that women's comics could be completely wild um, because nobody was watching. So we'll look at some, some of those images. This is actually her comic strip that she does, and she's won awards. She's a political uh, cartoonist. So if you ever see Slowpoke, she's just totally amazing. Anyway, here are some of the comics that she introduced me to from Twisted Sisters. Um, this is Aileen Kaminsky Crumb, R. Crumb's wife. Um, Twisted Sisters is like an uh, anthology of different underground comic uh, comic artists, women. Um, this is a fantastic cover. I'm not sure who that's by, but um, there's a collection that you can buy that has a, a bunch of the different strips that are really amazing. Um, and one of the artists later that was included was Julie Doucet. Um, I was completely obsessed with her early on when I was making work. Um, she would just create, these are covers obviously, so they're in color, but just uh, create these real, like really, her content was really real and from her life, like she would write about her relationships, write and draw about her relationships, her medical issues, um, but every inch of her drawings would just be like teeming with stuff. Um, and then she has one called My New York Diary, which basically made me move to New York because I, that specific comic, um, so it looks so fantastic, hanging out this very bohemian lifestyle with all her friends in bars. Um, this one's really, <laughs> like she'll do things and you're just like, and also, I mean, we're talking the 90s, like now people joke, not joke, but talk about like free bleeding and all this stuff. This is all like so far ahead of its time in terms of, um, you know, these very like sly, funny, um, this one, if I were a man, you know, there's they're funny and just smart. <laughs> so, oh, and then, sorry, that was like a, a, a fast transition um, uh, to other. This is, so I was also really influenced by Leon Golub, um, who almost stopped making art during the Vietnam War because he couldn't understand the point, which I think, you know, talking to graduate students and artists today, I feel like there's a similar sentiment, you know, in the face of, you know, politically what's going on in the face of climate change, like what's the point of art kind of? Um, so he was really struggling with that. And then he started to make these massive pieces, just like monumental pieces um, on raw canvas where he would just scrape the surface of the painting with a meat cleaver. And he, was, he would paint these really violent images of of mercenaries, um, but they're really powerful. I was like, just really, really into them. So after I graduated from UVA, I got a space in downtown Charlottesville, and this, these are really terrible images. They're converted from slides. Slides were these things we used to have, like, you know. But um, so I would take cardboard from the sandwich shop where I worked, and I would turn them into these big, like I was using charcoal and paint, but obviously extremely influenced by Leon Golub. Um, this is like wrestlers. 
Um, also influenced by underground comics. I would make these, this is like about a relationship. There's like a little insert with a couple. Um, and I would just like open up, see back then, I just looked at newspapers and magazines. I mean, that's all we had. It was like the late 90s. Um, and I would just go through and tear out photos and copy them and draw them. And um, this is the only painting I made. So I moved to New York um, after a year in Charlottesville after I graduated, moved to New York for a year. And this is the only painting I made that entire year in New York before I went to grad school. Um, but you can kind of see different elements combining. Um, this is like my grandmother wrestling or something. This is like literally like 97, I think. Um, so this is really funny. This is from when I was still in Charlottesville. I did an interview with a local paper. I mean, how old was I? Like 22, 23, something like that. And I said in this interview, doing a still life or anything from life is dead. Supposedly, all the exciting stuff is going on with sculpture, video, installation. But I've personally been struggling with trying to find a way to paint that isn't dead. I went to the Whitney Biennial a couple years ago, and the paintings were abstract. They were boring. The figure is what keeps the interest to me, for me. So then I go to the Art, Art Institute like the very next year. I'm making abstraction. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> so this is work. Well, so this is probably like two years in, you know, like this is my thesis work. Um, and so this is around 2000. Is, like the millennium. And this is also like pre 9-11. I feel like that was a different world. Like I can't imagine making such like fun disco-y work now. I don't know. But I was like listening to disco. Like one thing that's difficult to describe about that time is like the advent of like Photoshop and design. Um, Old Navy was like had amazing kind of design elements in their stores and online and it was all like super graphics and it, it was very different. It felt like a new century, you know? So I was like very influenced by a lot of that. I was looking at like surfboards and skateboards and um, painting abstractly, but kind of in this like, almost like a caricature of abstraction or something. Looking at like van art. Um, a lot of these are very um, intuitive too. So I'm like, just starting with one color on a piece of like shiny paper and then seeing where it goes. Um, I'm using a little bit of spray paint, um, fluorescence, super graphics. That's like lizard paper. This is very like kind of modernist. <laughs> this might take on like a modernist something. I thought I was the only person on earth using tape and spray paint because you could think that in 2000 because nobody had websites or like Instagram accounts where you could check on them. You're just like alone in your world. So I was like, ooh, I'm, I'm cool. Um, one of the things that was getting me really into abstraction, I mean, one of the influential texts um, was this piece from Freeze by Lane Relia. I think he's around. Like, yeah, he's really, really great. Um, so this text, he's talking about how younger artists at the time are starting to work abstractly, which at the time wasn't really happening that much. And this was kind of a new trend at that time. Um, so he says at one point, perhaps the absolutism that has long paralyzed 60s notions about art is a last thawing to the point where those notions can be made pliable again. And I would, for one, argue for their continued relevance. The aborted dialogue between the work of Nolan, Stella, and Judd still echoes through the present moment with concerns about visuality and beholding over how pictures come to life or play dead, addressed in terms more complicated than a simple yes, no, between affirmation and critique. Um, I love this text and I love him, but does anybody notice someone who's missing from this like, because he's talking about color field earlier, um, and he says, who are looking to Lewis and Noland for inspiration. Does anyone notice, if you're talking about color field, is there someone missing, anyone? Um, Helen Frankenthaler? Um, I was just, just like a little insert to just like correct the record. Um, this is from a piece by Peter Sheldahl in The New Yorker where he says, she was just 23 when she poured puddles of paint and palely glowing colors onto a cotton canvas to produce Mountains and Sea from 1952, which is the Rosetta Stone of color field. It's in the National Gallery of Art in DC. Greenberg showed the picture to Lewis, to Morris Lewis, and to the painter Kenneth Noland, both visiting, to, both visiting 
from DC on April 4th, 1953. Uh, if Colorfield were a nation, that day would be its 4th of July. Frankenthaler's work was the bridge from Pollock to what was possible, Lewis later declared. Um, so she's the original. <laughs> Lewis and Nolan came after her, and because her, she was dating Greenberg at the time, and he felt that it was unprofessional for him to write about her work. So not only did she not get written into the history, um, he showed her work to two guys who ended up copying it. Anyway, they're wonderful. They're all wonderful. I'm just saying. I just like. I also find it really funny that she could be the bridge to what was possible. Like Pollux, you can't copy. De Kooning, you can't copy. Helen Frankenthaler, oh, go ahead, riff, riff for a generation, you know? Anyway, so just remember that, okay. Um, so I got out of grad school, I started, I had this my first studio in Brooklyn, and I'm still making this kind of abstract work that's kind of playful, and um, these are coming from like visions, like smoke a little weed before I go to bed and have little visions, see the side of a bus and see colors that I really loved, like, so, and I'm making them all in this like Yupo paper. They're all the same scale. Um, but then one day I'm like walking in Chelsea and I see a sample sale for like, I think it was Zoo York or it was like an urban streetwear company um, that had like racks of t-shirts in the basement for $5 each. I mean, we're talking thousands of t-shirts. I start looking through them and I'm like, these t-shirts, the designs on these t-shirts are better, are at least as good as my paintings. And they've been screen printed. My paintings are completely flat. Like, what's the difference between my painting and a screen print? And t-shirt designers are doing better paintings than me. So I was like, I need to start making things a little bit more handmade. That's kind of where I came into it. So, uh, and I had Art Guerra, who has a paint company called Guerra Paint, was in my studio building. He started bringing me a bunch of acrylic. So I started experimenting with it. Acrylic really lends itself to experimentation versus something like oil paint because acrylic dries quickly. Um, so I started putting it in sheets and cutting it. Um, these are like little medallions of acrylic. Um, it's kind of thickening the paint and creating areas of thicker paint. Um, and then I have this like revelation where I have this idea like I want to include like fire. So here I've been making abstract work, but then I have this thought, like, what if I had included flames in one of my images? And I actually don't have the image of that painting that I put flames in, but it was kind of a breakthrough for me because I started to include sort of more realistic elements or surreal. So things from like rocks or like that's a belt from eBay, a moth wing. Um, this is like a tree that I saw so my work starts to shift into kind of more surreal direction. Um, yeah, a moth wing. Those are all little pieces of acrylic. This is like a suburban sound wall. Um, this is like in the background of like a Marvel movie, something like hanging, but that's all acrylic like hanging off the canvas. This is from um, Blade Runner. When they go to the maker at the end, this is one of the doors. So I'm like looking at everything and I'm making paintings from everything side of a building in France. Um, this is an elevator light. Um, uh, Tupperware lid with chocolate. My my shower curtain. I'm still, I'm kind of frustrated though because I feel like the work doesn't look like it's made by one person. Like it's kind of all over the place. Um, and I'm At the time I'm teaching, I taught until 2015 uh, middle school art in Brooklyn for 12 years and I'm really frustrated at that point. I'm like, my work looks like it's kind of made by a bunch of different people. Um, so my solution was just to make it more diverse. So uh, the students would leave drawings on the table sometimes that they didn't care about, and I would make them into paintings, um, just like project them. And I found this book of like how to paint in oil, and then I made I made the paintings that they want you to make in the book because I was kind of thinking like, is that a copyright issue if you do exactly what they told you to do. <laughs> so I made a bunch of these weird, but I was just like so curious about these compositions. Like, like what is this? What's going on here? I don't know. It's so weird. Or this, just like nude women in a room. Woo, like what? You know, this boxer. So I just copied a bunch of, like this is odd. Um, and then I would still, so now I'm still building up the paint. I'm still seeing things in real life. So this was at like a shoe cobbler. I like copied his sign. 
Um, this is like if you go to the art store and you see the like marker thing, it's all tagged up, like people write on it. So this is like a Pentel marker part of that, but it's like, I'm starting to bring things a little bit together. Um, this is the fluorescent light for a laundromat. Um, this is like from Clash of the Titans, I think. And this was an important piece for me because I was like, what, are, what do abs look like? So I just Googled abs <laughs> and I just made like a, I just made a painting based on that, on that, on the abs, on the JPEG that came up. Um, and then I remember on the same page, on the same search page, there was weirdly this like uh, painting, this palette. And so I was like, oh my gosh, okay, it made that into a painting. And then I started to Google palette. Um, and these are all JPEGs of different things that came up. Um, but then I was like starting to get a little bit like, so what's the deal? You're just gonna build up this paint and paint it exactly how it is. Like that's, that's kind of not that interesting. So um, I started to think, what if I could build the paint and then paint something separate on top, like even a contrasting image. So this is like Demi Moore from Vanity Fair. So I built up the paint as breast and then you have a tie painted over. So there's a contrast. Um, and then I kind of fell into this like world of body painting, um, just painting images that I found online um, of bodies painted. <laughs> this one's like ridiculous. <laughs> um, this one I have to say, um, painted in 2012. Obama, I felt like I could paint that in the Obama years, like a little bit low key, patriotic, like I couldn't, I don't think I could paint that now. Um, there's Jackson Pollock, there's a whole sub, a sub category of um, Jackson Pollock body painting. <laughs> so I just painted him with his own paint on his face. This was a poster I made for a show in 2012. Yeah, I think so, 2012, yeah. Um, USA Body Work It, and it has a lot of these paintings in it. It also had, like, you probably recognize some of these images of, like, painted hands, and I would add, like, an arm. Um, this is, like, um, this one is, like, with my right hand, I make the world. It's kind of a joke on painting, like, being, like, you know, I'm so great. I'm a painter. Um, and then here are some influences in this era. Um, Elizabeth Murray, we just saw a really nice drawing in the collection at the Cranbrook Museum. Um, she's just amazing, this is from 1982. This is an unbelievable piece. I don't have the exact scale, but I think it's like 12 feet. And this is uh, a structure with canvas stretched over it. Um, these, this series from the 80s is so nuts. And Robert Gober actually made her stretchers, which is cool too. Um, this is Lynn Folks. There was a big show at the New Museum of his work. He's an LA-based artist, or California. Um, and then, of course, Paul Tech. This is from 1964. It's like meat. It's like called birthday cake, but it's like meat within this kind of modern Judd-like structure. Um, so at the same time that I'm making those body paintings, I start make, seeing a lot of food uh, images in my feed on social media, um, and I start to make those. And I'm really interested in the fact that people are kind of showing off, like either what they're eating or like what they're making to eat or what they're going out to eat. It's kind of this kind of self-affirming, like, um, yeah, like, uh, yeah, just showing off. <laughs> um, but I'm curious about it because it's like where, the, they're taking these really great photographs of their meals, and I'm like, what is that influenced by? Is that still life painting? Is that like looking at a lot of like food photography and advertising? Um, but the compositions are really interesting. Um, and I'm sort of back at rendering things, you know, like I'm building them up and making them what they are, which is something I had tried to get away with from in the body painting. But at this point, I start to understand it differently, and I feel like, um, you know, First of all, it's a challenge formally. So I have a photo that I'm working towards, but if I build up the acrylic, then it's much harder for me to make it look super real. It just becomes this like, the acrylic is running interference and I'm trying to like cut it and like add it, subtract it and, and build around it. So 
that's a really satisfying part of it. It's also going to go back to Instagram or whatever social media platform it was on because people photograph it when it's in a gallery or I'll post it. So it'll circulate again online. It, it's also kind of weirdly animated. Because it's three-dimensional, it, it casts the shadow. Um, so it's like photographic, but it, it is strange in a, in a re-photograph. So that's also really interesting to me. Um, yeah, so I... I get really into that and I make a ton of these. My only rule for these was that, like this one, my gallerist at the time sent me this image, like I'm having oysters at Grand Central. <laughs> so I was like, all right, you know, sometimes people will send me images or I'd find things. Um, this is chicken and waffles. Some of these things I feel like, this is chicken and waffles like 2012, you know, it was like height of like, ooh, chicken and waffles has been, you know, claimed by like kind of, you know, a foodie establishment or something. Um, because it's on a silver plate. Um, are those clams? I can't remember what those are. Are those oyster? I don't know, but <laughs> muscle, mussels, alligar. There's a lobster roll. Um, but my rule is that I only make one of each type of food. So like I made a, um, like an In-N-Out burger and then I wouldn't make another In-N-Out burger, but i will make a Shake Shack. Um, <laughs> So, and then I have a friend in Brooklyn who's a chef, and one of the things he does is like post photos as he's fabricate, fabricating the meat in his restaurant because he wants people to know that it's like local and that he's doing it himself, that it's not like a factory situation, which I think is also kind of speaks to our time. So, he takes these amazing photos of the meat as he's like rendering it. So, he made a bunch of these. Um, he's kind of, yeah from his kitchen, there's some ribs, pancakes, curry sausage, they're kind of endless, I made a lot of them. Um, and then this is paper pulp, so sometimes I'll like build paper pulp and make kind of like a drawing or watercolor version. Um, at the same time, I'm still kind of exploring these muscle, muscle dudes, because I found so many images when I looked up abs. Um, <laughs> This is maybe Arnold, I don't know. I just like, I like the, the, I feel like the paint works really well with like body, this kind of muscly kind of ripples or something. Um, I think if you look back at that early work when I'm making all the fluorescent work, there is an element to my work where it's kind of screaming at you. It's always like in your, in your face in a certain kind of way. So this one was for a show called The Bathers. Um, which had a lot of like people lounging by bodies of water, or, like it, you know. And this was my contribution. Um, I started to make larger food paintings, which have multiple panels, because at that time people were starting to use this kind of collage feature on Instagram. Um, this is, uh, yeah, a larger piece, like three by three feet, sort of. Um, some kind of brunch, some kind of bread thing. Um, this one's kimchi hot dogs. Um, I just thought this was so great because there's like humor in some of these images where people are like taking multiple photos of their meal, like from all angles. Like, I don't think you got that. Let me take it from this angle. You know, there's like a real charm there. Um, uh, and then I did a show in 2014 based on this idea of reanimating something. And those are my tools, like paintbrush. And the, I just use a plastic deli knife with the, the um, teeth cut off. Um, so these are images and they're all square. I just kind of went through and had saved images that I really liked from my feed. Um, but they're all square. It's like 2014, so it's like height of kind of Instagram. This is like uh, carburetors. Um, this is kind of an image that circulated also on Tumblr. In fact, when I was teaching middle school, my kids recognize this image. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah seen that. Um, Who has braces is the title. Um, this is makeup. Um, I started to get into nail art. Um, this was an image that my friend took like partying one night and stubbed out her cigarettes. Like this is very early Instagram. <laughs> um, somebody compiled crotch shots from the Getty Villa. Um, so that's what that is. <laughs> but I thought it was like so lovely but also funny, you know. Um, and then I was really stuck on this image 
uh, makeup tutorials becoming like kind of ascendant, but also thinking about the painting as like drawing and painting itself while it looks at you. It wants you to like it and it's trying to make itself basically. Um, so that actually led to a whole body of work um, where I made a lot of these eye tutorials. That's like nine of them. They're each like 30 by 30. So it's like a nine by nine foot piece, but they're separate. Like you can take them apart. Um, so I made a lot of these. I started to get into kind of more um, like, what is it, uh, costume makeup? Not beauty makeup, but more costumey. Um, this one I just thought was so funny because it's like, that's what it's supposed to look like. But like, you know, it goes, it doesn't look quite like it's supposed to. Um, uh, yeah, so some more kind of costume makeup. I was just so fascinated with the fact that there's this whole aspect of makeup online that is not about beauty. Um, Halloween, uh, Little Mermaid, Burger Eye. Yeah, and also this idea that makeup is potentially genderless. Like, you don't know, especially at this scale, like, you know, you're just free to make whatever. Even though I think probably a lot of people look at makeup and think, oh, that's feminine. But, you, you know, makeup is um, this kind of great equalizer in terms of, you know, it doesn't matter what gender you were born, you can use it. In fact, uh, most of the, the biggest pioneers in makeup have come from drag or, um, yeah, so, like, contouring. And then there's a whole aspect of, like, kind of art, you know, this is pop art, lip, um, pop art. Um, she's, yeah, um, there's that Cleopatra again. Um, this is a really large piece. It's six by six feet, um, weighs like a ton. So this is the first one I made like on that scale and it's like a whole other kind of animal because all of a sudden they're so heavy that I'm like Richard Serra, like trying to move them around and stuff. But I was kind of thinking of color field with this one. I wanted to keep it very simple. Um, and then I made subsequent ones. Um, these are all large. This was an installation for Freeze New York where I decided like everything at this art fair is gonna be painting and there are gonna be thousands of paintings and I don't wanna just have my paintings on the wall so I created these like cubes to show them in. Um, but so it's kind of, you know, they're separate. Like if you wanted to buy one, you had there, you could separate the cube, but then it could also just be its own thing. Um, this is like zipper lips. Um, I did, I've done one large eye <laughs> tutorial. These are all the large ones. This is a recent one. These two are actually recent this year. Um, this is really recent. Like this is gonna be in Miami at Basel. This is like, a couple weeks old. <laughs> um, so, and I'm also, yeah, I continued with the nail art. Um, so crazy, like, come on, what? <laughs> this is so funny. Um, these little canvases on your nail, but it, it, it's a way to incorporate the hand, too. Um, this one, like, I had a group of middle school uh, boys come through my PS1 show, like a private school boys, and they were just like, that's my favorite. <laughs> I was like, it's really disturbing. Because, like, it's it's actually, like, you know, pretty violent, like, but. Um, and then various artworks. Um, I don't know why that says text in the middle. I need to go fix that. I don't know where that came from. But, um, <laughs> Typo, that's corn nails. That's a recent piece from last year, or this year, actually. So another aspect of my work that I got into was this idea of memes, and the thought that memes could also really communicate without words sometimes. Um, but I also like the surreal aspect of this. This is kind of a phenomenon when we're online where you can't tell if something's real or not real because of Photoshop, because of deep fakes. Like, there, there's a lot of suspicion when you're looking at images. So. Um, these are all like kind of <laughs> memes that are easily, I wanted to see the, how they would translate. This one is like the amount of time I have for this shit, which I think is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, yeah. Um, but I was also interested in the idea of a real space within a painting and then a fake real space. Um, uh, this is kind of, some of these you might even have seen as 
has memes. This is like if you Google equality, I think that might be turned, but um, it's like a Google, if you Google equality, there are lots of images like this. Um, it's like preg I think she's pregnant. Um, then I I'll also kind of one thing that you pick up when you are online a lot is a lot of like uh, referencing of master paintings and famous paintings, like different kinds of artistic communities, whether they're body painting or um, I don't know what kind of genre this is. It's like bacon. Um, but, you know, they're drawing a line between their creativity and then a master work. Um, which, so, like, with images like this, I mean, it's a meme, kind of, but it's also, like, for me, funny because I'm a painter. I, like, kind of really like Van Gogh, or at least early on, you know, really, really influenced by it. Love him, but it's kind of embarrassing. It's a little bit cheesy. Um, and these are just kind of memes, um, more memes. Um, this one you've probably seen around. Um, yeah, this is a recent show I had in April in Berlin of just like small works, small kind of meme works. Um, so these are a couple shows. This is a show I did in 2017 in London. And I just went off these two, ripped off these two things. The, I went back to the palette paintings and I started to make large ones. And then I was also really curious, this idea of, because I've experimented so much with like three dimensions, like what's the most three dimensional thing I can make, which is a, a ball in my mind. So I start, I just like Googled ball, which is so dumb. But it <laughs> turns out it's just basically athletic ball, like different kinds of athletic balls. So I started to make these works. Um, so this show is kind of both um, uh, athletic. And this, this is the kind of paint tray that when I was an art teacher, I had to wash like hundreds a day. So it's important to me in a lot of, on a lot of different levels, um, a watercolor. Then I'm also incorporating palettes and palettes, like makeup palettes. Because if you Google palette now, it's just makeup. There is no, because one of the sad things about Google has been the complete commodification of it. It used to be like you could Google, like Google things and find completely random stuff immediately. Now you have to go like 10 pages in because you have to get past all the products, right? They're trying to sell you stuff for the first like 10 pages. So palette is just gonna be makeup. Um, yeah, so these are palettes. This. These are installation shots of the cubes, and then these are the individual works. That's like a yoga ball, a, a golf ball, um, and that's kind of a millennial pink. I don't know, even though I'm not a millennial. Um, there's a, what is that called? Volleyball. Um, and part of this, the obsession with, this is stationary that you could write on. Um, so I made a lot of these different images. Um, one of my, ideas with this was that someone had said, oh, your work is really feminine. And I kind of thought that was dumb. Um, so I was, I just happened to think at the same time I was buying balloons from a friend and you know, those Mylar balloons that you have filled with air and they had like 40 for girls and they had two for boys and the two for boys were like soccer ball, basketball. And I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, if my work's feminine, that this is masculinity, like that's also really dumb. So I just like feminine image, masculine image to kind of play with like the stupidity of that. Um, palette, yeah, uh, nail art, nail art. I have, a, yeah, a lot of images, I'm sorry. E Go through those quick. Okay, and then sometimes I have random painting, I make random paintings of images that I find online. This is like skeleton bras. She can just find so many amazing photos that would just make really interesting paintings. Um, this is from a show I did in 2018. Um, I showed you that butt cake. And I found this show is called Van Goddess and the Master Bakers. Um, master Bakers, I kind of think of people that make really sexy cakes. Um, so for the bachelorette parties or whatever. Um, so these are all how to make like a sexy cake. Um, yeah, how to make a butt cake, sexy butt cake. Um, and then I had a room in the show that was all Van Gogh. That's like a replica of his palette, like blown up really big. I, I painted it. It's really fun to paint Van Gogh's palette. And then these are just various products from um, the internet. <laughs> so that's the Van Goddess room. That's his, his palette.
And then in the other room, I had this thing called Photoshop mistake. It's like Mondrian. I was like, you know how when you copy things in Photoshop, they appear huge sometimes, like, or on top of another image, you're just like, whoa. So I was copying that little cube, and then I got a giant version. And I just thought it looked cool, and I wanted to make, like, a version of it. So this is one of the issues with spaces in LA, is, like, emerging spaces in LA are, are still really massive. So you end up, like, proposing these giant projects. I think this gallerist was like, what the hell? Like, this was, like, 11 by 11 feet. Um, so this is like the Mondrian room, and these are the paintings from that cube. Um, these are more recent. This one's called Sober. Um, there are lots of these tutorials online uh, for animators and video game developers on like hands. Um, and this, I just like this combination, and then this piece with a, with a Louise Nettleton. So the, <laughs> those are the two works. This is a group show in Italy. Um, I made, this is also recent from a show in Berlin. This is like uh, saving for a home. Oh no, this one's heart health. So if you, you see those images online of like a heart, this is saving for a home. Um, these are images from my PS1 show. That's a new piece in the background with the paintbrushes. I'm trying to, I'm sort of stepping away from makeup and into, like if you Google paintbrush lips, you'll find all these crazy JPEGs and, and uh, stock photos of like women with a paintbrush at their lips, like all dramatic. Um, so I started like experimenting with those. That wall in the back at the PS1 show, we kind of called the MAGA wall because it has like the American flag, it has the guns, it has the dude with the like, um, it just feels like, even though these works were all made like way before you know who. Um, <laughs> there are corn nails, yeah. There's a giant meat painting on that wall that's, just like burnt meat, and I just felt like that was like sort of a current mood. And then these are really recent. These are going, okay, so I have had one person contact me about an image that I took offline, and it was fine, it all worked out, but they were very indignant. And like, I, at some level, I really get it, but then there's this idea that like, like if you make a meme, like I can make memes, you know? So. For these pieces, I was like looking for eggplant nails online. I was Googling around. There's got to be eggplant emoji nails somewhere. Could not find them. So I made my own like kind of version of that. Um, so I'm like, I can make memes. Like, I'm, I think I can handle this. So um, this, I don't, yeah. It's like, these are really rough photos from the studio. Um, but um, that one is kind of bringing together a couple different themes. The food, the palette. Um, okay, so that's me. <laughs> um, so I started like making my own. If I'm gonna make my own memes, then I'm gonna make my own like makeup. So that's like a Franz Klein. <laughs> um, and so these are kind of like I haven't made these paintings yet, but these are some of the things I'm I'm working on. There's Jackson Pollock in there. There's Ellsworth Kelly. Um, this one has some Mondrian and Rothko. Um, this is kind of a weird one. It has a little bit of George O'Keefe. Um, okay, cool. So now we're just at the part, I'm sorry, I'm gonna rush through the rest of this. Um, this is really interesting. This is a new book that's out, Gia Tolentino, who writes for The New Yorker, called Trick Mirror. Um, I wanted to read you this part. Um, so she's talking about trolling and Gamergate, and she says, so this idea of a woman being online and like this self-referential nature of my work, um, so she says, in, particularly, in particular, the misogyny embedded in trolling reflects the way women who, as John Berger wrote, have always been required to maintain an external awareness of their own identity, often navigate these online conditions so profitably. It's the self-calibration that I learned as a girl, as a woman, that has helped me capitalize on having to be online. My only experience of the world has been one in which personal appeal is paramount and self-exposure is encouraged. This legitimately unfortunate paradigm inhabited first by women and now generalized to the entire internet is what trolls loathe and act actively repudiate. Anyway, there's a larger discussion about trolling, but just this idea, idea that women grow up self-conscious um, and that that lends itself so easily to a life online um, and that now that self-consciousness is spread to everyone, I thought it was like a really important um, observation and something that I think I'm dealing with um, in my work when I'm including myself now. Um, this, 
this image from earlier, um, there's a great book, another Lane Relia piece um, called, I think it's, well, this is piece is called DIY Abstraction. Um, so he says the only option, so he's talking about this kind of like limitless kind of painting where you just feel like you're like painting, 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 you're just making work in this, at this insane pace and you're just like cycling through things. And he says that he thinks it's a reflection of a sort of DIY aesthetic. Um, the only option artists have is to act out their daily material practice uh, in their daily material practice, the society's reigning terrifying belief in the short term, the temporary, the moment to moment, the always on call, the get it while you can, enjoy it while it lasts. Here, artistic labor becomes nearly indistinguishable from flex time wage labor, anonymous, abstract, interchangeable, and disposable. Painting is just doing stuff, like a hamster on its treadmill, as if in a perpetual feedback loop over and over with no other further objective in sight. And like, I think that it's, I mean, he's talking about abstraction and this kind of like restless abstraction, but I think it can apply to figuration and a kind of restless, like, it's just this, yeah, I think this is important, <laughs> an important observation as well. Um, having said that, like, let's watch this. <laughs> oh, the first step is we take a, sorry, this is Meg Allen Co, who's, Cole, who's amazing. She's my sister's be best friend from from college, and she's a you. I think you no. She's on. Mm, she's on a network online, um, crafting. She's amazing. If you follow her, she's really fantastic. So this is not directed at her at all. This you'll just uh, you'll get it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, that's just kind of to say, like what what you're up against as a painter um, and an artist in general. I mean, I think that like it's. Um, you know, there is art being made within culture and there are lines between craft. I mean, all of this, I'm not like completely dismissing. I'm just saying like that's, there's a whole world of like art making out there that is not, um, that you're kind of up against. I don't know. Anyway, you get it. Okay. Um, one thing, these are kind of older images, but one thing I like to do and like to say to students is like, Go on the Urban Outfitters. I just saw, by the way, that Urban Outfitters is like not doing well financially. They just said they might close or they might they have really bad earnings. But while they're still around, go to their wall art section and see if your work looks like anything um, that they're selling. And not just because they might have ripped you off, <laughs> which they've done before, but also because I kind of feel like if they're selling a $250 version or something similar to what you're making or that you're you're making in the studio, then you might not be like pushing things hard enough. You like you might not push be pushing towards an edge hard enough. You know, I I really think that. So, um, you know, they're totally fine, interesting images, but I don't know. That's that's how I think about it. Um, this is like a fake marble kind of. Um, these are totally great pieces, and I'm just saying. Um, if you're really trying to find some breakthrough into something new. Um, this is kind of like a Jonas Wood ripoff. Um, okay. I just really like Mike Kelly, so. Now, uh, you once said, art making is making your sickness everyone else's sickness. I didn't say that. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> and uh, Joseph Boyd said, art is genuinely a genuinely human medium for revolutionary change in the sense of completing the transformation from a sick world to a healthy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Boyd obviously had some notion of art as a curative process. I don't have that delusion. Really? No. I think, I think art is an analytic process, and you choose to use it for healthy purposes or you do not. I don't think you can force people to um, be cured. And also, I don't think art ever cures you. It just makes you aware of the problems you have. So what, 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 was, I, what was it I was supposed to have said? Um, uh, art is making your sickness everyone else's sickness. Okay, well, I agree with that in, in, ah. the, in the sense in the sense that 
Art used to be seen as a personal sickness that showed your genius, like how you were better than other people. In actuality, art is just saying, well, let's just point this out mm -hmm. and we can talk about it. I'm no different from you. I'm no better than you. I'm no special than you. I'm no genius that cut off my ear. I'm just another schmuck like you. And, and what I like about, say, Boyce, for example, which isn't revealed in that, was like, he had a very egalitarian idea of art. You know, like you can all be artists now, but in a way, of course, I don't believe that either. I think it's, a lot of people just don't have the talent to, to be, um, um, well, they don't have the strength to stand outside of culture and to make a fool of themselves. Like, he was a professional fool. And a lot of artists are professional fools. And what I like, dislike about a lot of contemporary artists is that they want to be hipsters. They, they're not willing to be fools. They're not willing to, you know, to put themselves on the line in some, in some shared emotional way. They want to be better than other people. And that's, to me, worse than the old idea about being the outsider and being tragic and you know, a suicidal and all that crap. Instead, they want to be like a fucking rock star. They want to be better. They want to be Britney Spears. And it's like, I don't want to see a bunch of artists like Britney Spears. I, you know, kill them all. <laughs> so great. Oh, sorry. This was a piece that I had seen in grad school that just changed my, like, perspective on everything. Because, um, you know, an artwork that's telling you that it sucks, you know, like, I'm not grand, I'm not spectacular, I, I'm a loser. And like, I, you know, and in a sense that has its own kind of cachet and like is better than you in a certain kind of way, you know, if you go further down the rabbit hole, but at the time, and I still think it's like very liberating. Um, it liberates you from a lot of like grandstanding or something. Um, this beautiful piece from the Rubel collection that's like a little bit modernist, um, a little bit Americana thrift store. Um, um, and I'm also showing a Jeff Koons, but this is just to explain this notion that I have, um, and I think we're talking in the studio today <laughs> about um, uh, European culture versus American culture. I, I love this piece, this is hanging in Versailles. And to me, like his best works are the um, the pool toys that are inflated and they're made out of steel. Um, but it's sort of this comment on, well, this is our culture. <laughs> you know, you guys got Versailles and these paintings, and this is ours. You know, like, hey guys. Um, but also to really like analyze that and to think about that and to think that culture is culture. I mean, granted, I'm an anthropology major, so like all culture is good culture, you know? Um, but I also think about that in, in my work and, and to, to try not to put this weight on yourself. Like, your life, your culture is as important as anybody else's, you know? Um, and being said that, this is a great David Hammond's piece um, that, he, that he executed outside Cooper Union in New York. Um, it's called Blizzard from 1983. And just so brilliant, um, talking about like, you know, Mike Kelly talking about the artist as a professional fool. He's out here like, you know, making a comment on um, economics, on capitalism, um, on poverty, on um, artists as, make, as a pr product maker. Um, and also, you know, the just like completely fleeting nation, notion fleeting nature of making an object that just completely melts, like, um, just so layered and so brilliant. Um, yeah. Uh, this is a thing, I used to end on this, but I have one more slide. But um, this is from this great book, Please Pay Attention, Please, by Bruce Nauman, about a, co a conversation with Kusi von Bruggen. Um, I would tell her something that had been very important to me in terms of how to structure performance or some art activity, and she would say, oh, but it wasn't like that. I said, it's the way I remember it. So she calls what I did a creative misreading or a creative misunderstanding, and I feel like so much of what I understand about art 
is that kind of thing where I've misunderstood something. So like not to feel pressure to always get it exactly right because in fact those are the places where really amazing things can happen in your work. Um, also Kuzi van Bruggen we know is Oldenburg's partner who made all the almost all of those works with him just so just a little amending the record on that. Um, okay, last thing. I think this is the last one, yeah. So like I was saying earlier, um, when I was talking about Leon Golub, a lot of artists talking about uh, what's the point in making art. And this is just a piece. Now we're basically like on my Facebook or my Facebook or Twitter feed as I just like share articles with you. But this is Michael Sh Chabin from uh, the Paris Review in September. What's the point of making art? And this was a letter that he wrote to the McDowell Colony because uh, he's resigning, I guess. Not just, he's just not gonna do it anymore. It wasn't like under bad circumstances or anything. But he has a very contemplative uh, piece about um, what is the point of making art? Um, so I'm just gonna read you a couple things. Maybe the purpose of art, the blessing of art, has nothing to do with improvement, with amelioration, with making this heartbreaking world, this savage and dopey nation, a better place. Um, to experience the truth, he goes on later in art, reminds us that there is such a thing as truth. And what is that truth? That truth of art, that freeing blade, that slaking drink in the desert of the world, drink in the desert of the world. It's this, you are not alone, I am not I, you are not you, we are we. All the world's power over us lies in its ability to persuade us that we are powerless to understand each other, to feel and see and love each other and that therefore it is pointless for us to try. Art knows better, which is why the world tries to, so hard to make it impossible, to, mis, to make art impossible, to immiserate artists, to ban their work, silence their voices, and why it's so important for all of us to quite simply make art possible. We are each only one poem, one painting, one song away from another mind, another heart. Um, and I was thinking a lot about that in the sense that you know, authoritarian um, powers will will try to separate or uh, stifle conversation and connection between people um, because they need us kind of separated. And this idea that art could bring people to, not, I mean, that sounds really hokey, but like that art could appeal mind to mind or heart to heart as a very anti-authoritarian gesture. So, all right, thanks. <laughs> if you have questions. <laughs>